It's happening now. Folks across the Midwest are rushing to save big money at Menards and get 11% off everything. Hmm, now that I think about it, my recording studio does need a bit of an upgrade. I better hurry up and finish this read. Hurry in to get started on those big projects and save big money with 11% off everything at Menards. Savings are mail-in rebate in the form of an in-store merchandise credit check. See store for details. Honey, I'm heading out to Menards. Save big money. Biz Podcast delivers tea news that you need to know. A recap of the week's major headlines with commentary and cultural trends hosted by Dan Bolton. It is the voice of origin for tea professionals and enthusiasts worldwide. Think of us as a digital caravan of storytellers bringing authentic, authoritative, exotic, and exclusive stories to you weekly from the tea lands. Each week, the Tea Biz Podcast summarizes news with the greatest impact on the tea industry. But tea requires far more nuanced coverage than the recitation of production volumes and commodity prices. That is why the Tea Biz Podcast is paired with the more inclusive Tea Biz blog and Tea Journey magazine. The podcast offers a weekly mix of news and features. It is innovative and interactive permitting listeners to conveniently contact reporters at Origin to ask questions that are answered via text messages that are delivered privately to their phone. Welcome. Here are the headlines. India surpasses Brazil as the world's COVID hotspot. The Global Tea Initiative at the University of California, Davis, hosts a second virtual event. Tea imports spike in Pakistan, and Tea Masters Cup names champions in Moscow. More in a minute, but first, this important message. Avani empowers rural women practicing sustainable agriculture, including tea and crafts, such as weaving with natural fiber and plant-based dyes. Up in the towering Himalayas, Kuman is one of India's oldest tea regions. Today, we raise our cups in the name of Avani Kuman, a nonprofit dedicated to strengthening farming communities. Cheers to a brighter future for all. To donate, visit avani kuman.org. Tea gardens are taking extra precautions as a second wave totaling nearly 200,000 daily infections forced lockdowns in Mumbai this week and heightened fears across the country. In March, the daily count was under 15,000 across India. Nine states, including tea-growing regions Kerala and Karnataka, this week reported their highest ever daily count. The virus is now killing more than a 1,000 daily. West Bengal, which includes Kolkata, recorded its highest single-day spike of 4,800 cases this week. The state's death count is 10,400, about 10 times greater than Assam. West Bengal is inoculating more than 100,000 people a day. Assam, which produces the largest quantity of tea in India, is faring much better with 1,023 active cases. The state has reported 221,000 cases and 1,119 deaths since the onset of the pandemic. Business Insight Dry weather in West India is causing greater havoc than the coronavirus right now driving down yield and idling workers and factories. The Global Tea Initiative at the University of California, Davis, will host the second in its Talking About Tea series from 3 to 5 p.m. Friday, April 23rd. The virtual presentation on myths, legends, and anecdotes includes research papers, presentations on tea poetry, and early writings about tea, 
with a review of tea gardens of London in the 17th and 18th century. The GTI website has more than 30 presentations available for viewing. Founding director Catherine Burnett said this will be a, quote, more casual, conversational, end quote, event than the first session in January. She said people will be able to chat with each other and comment and network and share ideas, learn from each other, and and get that kind of personal engagement that you can do on site. Admission to the Zoom event is free. Visit globalt.ucdavis.edu to register. Tea imports spike in Pakistan. The pandemic boosted tea imports by 27% to 171.5 metric tons for the eight months ending February 2021. The value of tea imports grew 17% compared to the same period ending in February of 2020. Pakistan ranks third among the tea importing nations, spending more than $500 million on tea annually, according to the Pakistan Bureau of Statistics. The Bureau recorded a 20% increase in the country's trade deficit last year, lending new urgency to reducing foreign exchange outflow. Pakistan has grown small quantities of tea since 1958, but until recently it was less costly to import tea from India. Due to border hostilities, India no longer ships tea direct to Pakistan. Business Inside Last week, the Gazaw Tea Association in China offered to assist Pakistan grow more tea locally, utilizing cultivars' expertise and machinery from China to produce broken-leaf black tea. Five years ago in Morocco, Guzan began working with the local blenders and packers to create a profitable local brand in North Africa. Quote, We can make breakthroughs in technology and increase productivity, said GTAC Secretary General Xu Jimin. In Guza, small farmers rely on an enterprise-driven model that could find success in Pakistan. The pandemic forced the cancellation of qualifying rounds and limited appearances at exhibitions to a single event during the 2021 cycle, but the Tea Masters Cup concluded successfully at the recent Coffee, Tea, and Cacao Russian Expo in Moscow. 61 Tea Masters competed in tasting and tea preparation categories that were modified to prevent sharing cups. Nikolai Dolji, the reigning tea-tasting champion, successfully defended his top ranking by identifying every outlier when presented with six sets of three infusions in three minutes. Olga Alicio Dinico won the tea preparation category, besting 16 contenders in preparing two teas. Arvinda Anantharaman in Bengaluru brings us this week's tea price report. India price report, sale 14 week ending April 10th. Drought-like conditions plague Darjeeling, Kangra and parts of Assam. The mood has been understandably gloomy. Meanwhile, hailstorms in Assam over the weekend affected several tea-growing districts. In the south, rain showers have arrived or are expected this week. Prices for sale 14? Despite a much-awaited start of the Kolkata auction, sale 14 did not open on a high note. Only 55% of tea on offer was sold. Gohati saw better responses and prices to orthodox leaf and dust, with 100% of the dust sold. A green tea from the Doni Polo Garden in Arunachal Pradesh sold for 612 rupees, making it the highest price this week. The Siliguri auction focused only on CTC leaf and dust this week. In Kochi, supply co was missed among buyers and the CTC dust market found few takers, leading to prices dropping by 5 to 10 rupees. Orthodox dust did better than CTC dust, at 86% sold to upcountry buyers and the local market. Orthodox leaf also did well with 80% sold. CIS countries and the Middle East were the main buyers. 
Nilgiri's tea fetched good prices at a low of 230 rupees and a high of 311 rupees. Kunur and Coimbatore auction prices were similar. Kunur saw a high volume of tea on offer this week. As for prices, Homedale Estates Red Dust Tea Grade topped the list at 305 rupees a kilo. A limited quantity of green tea was on offer in Kunur and all of it was sold. And now, a word from our sponsor. Q Trade Teas works with tea purveyors at every scale, from promising startups to the world's largest multinational beverage brands in the hot, iced, and bottled tea segments. With US based formulation, blending, and packaging services, Q Trade can help you innovate, scale up, and grow your specialty tea brand. For more information, visit our website, qtradetees.com. This week, T-Biz offers a glimpse of the many teas of India. Arvinda and our theremin takes us on a tour revealing there's a lot more to savor than chai. And we travel to the idyllic Summer Lodge Country House Hotel in Dorchester, England, for a new take on the old English tradition of afternoon tea. Almost 1.4 billion people live in India. Together, they consume about 20% of the tea produced globally, including most of the tea grown there. Consumption averages 840 grams per person annually. It slowed a bit to 2.5% in 22, much weaker than in previous years, due largely to retail closures. But that doesn't mean India lost its taste for tea. They just prepared more at home. Known for their beloved chai, their preferences are as diverse as the people who live there. India's association with chai is a long and strong one. Chai connotes milky sweetness, a social break in the day, train journeys, spices. But here's the thing, it's not the only kind of tea that enjoys cultural popularity in the country. Here are a few teas from across India with deep cultural affinities and quite a far cry from chai. In the south, coffee is a popular beverage, except in Kerala, where tea is a staple. The Sulaimani is a tea from Kerala's Mopla Muslim community in the Malbar region. While its origin is undocumented, there are references to its connection with the Arabian beverage called the Kawa, made with dates and black pepper. There was sea trade between the Arabian and Malabar coasts, so there could be some truths here. The Sulaimani is made with black tea, cardamom, cinnamon, lime juice and sugar or honey. Some add a pinch of saffron. Moving west, tea time for the Parsi community in India is choy, black tea with mint and lemongrass, and if available, spearmint. Famous for their baking skills, the Parsis enjoy their tea with something sweet or sometimes a sandwich. Choy is made with any black tea, leaf or CTC or dust, steeped in boiling water along with the mint and lemongrass. It's sweetened and served with a spot of milk. Up north, Kashmir has the kava. It's not an everyday drink, but an occasional one, usually served before and after a feast. The kava is made with a bit of green tea, but saffron and cardamom pods are the mainstay of this beverage. It's sweetened and garnished with slivers of almond. Sometimes a little milk is added, making it the dood or milk kava. The kava is served from a samovar, as befitting its celebratory status. Everyday tea in Kashmir is the noon chai, or salt tea. This is made from a green tea concentrate. To serve, milk and salt are added to the concentrate. The tea has a faint pink colour from the addition of soda and it's enjoyed for the warmth it delivers. The salt tea is also the preferred tea in the northwestern parts of India in places like Ladakh. Sharing ties with Tibet, the tea here is pocha or salted butter tea. In the east, where so much of India's tea grows, there's no dearth of tea choices. But in Calcutta, tea on the streets is lebu cha, which is lemon black tea with a touch of black salt that gives it its spicy, tangy, sour sweetness. For the East, tea is preferred black and smoked. In Manipur and parts of Assam and Nagaland, tea has been enjoyed even before the British brought it here. Tea is made from leaves harvested from wild-grown bushes. It's withered, dried and stuffed into bamboo and allowed to smoke over the stove for an extended period. Smoky black tea is a staple. I suspect there are more teas that would make it to this list, which just emphasizes the truth about tea, that it's a versatile beverage and its place in the culture comes from how one has made it one's own. 
afternoon tea reimagined. Situated in the rolling hills of Dorset, the Summer Lodge Country House Hotel and Restaurant is the perfect setting to savor an afternoon tea in the idyllic English countryside. But when the pandemic closed the hotel, the restaurant staff was forced to cleverly design an afternoon tea takeaway so memorable this old English tradition became an Instagram hit for patrons unboxing their dainties at home. The global pandemic has wreaked havoc on hospitality businesses the world over. This is Dallinger Silver from PM David Silver & Sons sitting down in conversation with Jack McKenzie, the general manager of the luxury Summer Lodge Country House Hotel, part of the Red Carnation Hotel Group that's based in Evershot, in Dorsetshire in rural England. We sit down and we talk about how his business has pivoted from offering traditional afternoon tea in a country house setting to offering afternoon tea in a customer's home. Food and beverage is an important stream of revenue for hotels. How important was afternoon tea for, for your hotel prior to the pandemic? Uh, afternoon tea has always been a hugely important part of our food and beverage operation. You know, as I think it allows us a connection with our local area that sometimes the rest of our f and doesn't. It's a much more accessible service to people. You can experience amazing service, but at a reasonable price. So, you know, we've always re- relied on it very heavily to, to be a way of keeping in touch with people from our local vicinity. That said, it's fantastic revenue stream. You know, often she generates a lot of money for us. It's a hugely popular pastime for people to do, to get together. And it's a fantastic way to showcase the hotel. How has the hotel adapted to the pandemic? And what have you done to still generate revenue whilst we've been in this lockdown here in Britain? Being out in the countryside like we have been, during the lockdowns, generating revenue is tough. We don't have enough population on our doorstep to really warrant bringing chefs into the kitchen full time. So we decided against doing general takeaways like like a lot of other places have done and we decided instead to focus um, on the special occasions mothering sunday easter sunday getting our our name out there so we are not forgotten and for us often in tea was the best way to do that you know it uh it was something which was easily transportable you didn't have to worry about it being hot or cold uh, often in tea was absolutely perfect the demand is more than we thought it was going and to be in the best thing really was uh, was seeing people's reaction. You know, when they got home and they unpacked their afternoon tea, and suddenly you see it popping up on Instagram and on Facebook and on Twitter, people you know, posting pictures of the summer lodge in their own home. It's a really good, feel good factor for us, I think. What have been the biggest challenges in pivoting your business to offering delivery afternoon tea? The challenges actually have not been that many for us. Uh, you know, it was something which which came to us fairly naturally. And a lot of the issue for us actually have revolved around things which we couldn't really control. It took us quite a long time to, to find some packaging that, that, that we thought would be in keeping with the standard of what we were trying to provide. I think, to be perfectly honest, I think we're still not 100% there. I think, you know, we can do better there. Afternoon tea is a, is a labor-intensive thing to prepare. It's intricate. It's delicate. It takes time. You know, and so we need to throw a lot more time and resource at at giving the team enough time to get that prepared. The afternoon tea takeaways for us are definitely something that we're keeping long term. You know, it's been a very, very positive thing. Intrigued by what you heard in today's podcast? Would you like to learn more from our global network of T-Biz journalists and tea experts? Contact them direct through Subtext, a private message-based platform. Avoid the chaos of social media and start a conversation that matters. Subtext message-based platform lets you privately ask meaningful questions of the tea experts, academics, and T-Biz journalists reporting from the tea lands. You see their responses via SMS texts, which are sent direct to your phone. Visit our website and subscribe to Subtext to instantly connect with the most connected people in tea. Remember to visit the T-Biz website for more comprehensive coverage. That's www.t-bizbiz.com. Thanks for listening. Farewell till next week.